You're listening to NewStreamingNetwork.com, home of GoingSoloMedia.com and WGSN DB Going Solo Network Radio Podcasts and TV. Welcome to Divorce Coalition Live, a show designed for divorce professionals to enhance the divorce process to prevent re-traumatization of domestic abuse survivors. I'm your host, Jill Kaufman, therapist, divorce coach, and co-parenting expert. The Divorce Coalition is a nonprofit organization dedicated to increasing education and awareness of divorce professionals and so that they can process change to create a more supportive and less traumatic divorce experience. We have united top podcast hosts and divorce professionals to create systematic change in the divorce process for domestic abuse victims. With 23.5% of divorces citing domestic violence as a cause, we bring you expert guests, practical advice, and enlightening conversations. Knowledge is power in creating change in the world of divorce with domestic abuse. So without further ado, let's get started. In today's world of divorce, the legal system plays a critical role in divorce. For domestic abuse survivors going through divorce, the the system can both help and harm. When one spouse uses the legal system to inflict pain and harassment, we call that legal abuse. Today, I'm asking my guest, Teresa Vieira, to share her expertise about the legal process. Teresa Vieira is a North Carolina licensed practicing family law attorney with over 12 years of experience. She is also a certified family financial mediator. Teresa's intimate understanding of the North Carolina family court system stems from her personal experience as a survivor of domestic violence and child abuse. Despite the challenges her family faced, they emerged stronger. Teresa earned her law degree from the University of North Carolina School of Law, where she developed her skills in negotiation, mediation, and litigation. As the founder of Modern Legal, Teresa aims to reshape the legal system to better address the needs of families and domestic violence survivors. Okay. Hi, Teresa. Hey, Jill. How are you? (laughs) I'm good. Welcome. Thank you. So um, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself and what what you do? Sure. So I am a family law attorney, a certified family financial mediator uh, here in North Carolina, and I founded my own law firm, a family law firm, uh, which is based out of Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, We do serve family law clients. We've expanded a little bit into estate planning as well, and we serve both North and South Carolina. Awesome. And this is your website, modernlegalnc.com. That's us. Awesome. Okay. Well, so what is domestic violence from a legal versus reality standpoint? Uh, sure. That's a, that's a pretty complicated question, honestly, um, because legal terms are defined to be very specific. And that's because judges need to have guidelines or parameters on the relief that they grant through, say, the court process. Uh, So, for example, in North Carolina, we have a a form of relief, the Domestic Violence Order of Protection, that falls under North Carolina General Statute 50B. And under that statute, there is a definition for domestic violence. However, between you and me and all the listeners, that is a much more narrow definition than what we would consider domestic violence in general. Um, So, for example, the uh, North Carolina general statute that I cited, 50B, does require that for said relief, there has to be imminent harm or imminent threat of harm, meaning it requires imminency. Different from that, though, is the reality that domestic violence could happen systemically, could be habitual, and maybe it's not imminent in the sense that it's going to happen in the next hour or day, but because of how the cycle of domestic violence occurs, it is going to happen unless that cycle is broken. Um, Go one step further, when we're seeking a domestic violence order of protection, that is generally to protect the physical being of a person or anyone who may be facing any threats of harm. So that could be the person who's filing it. Uh, In divorce situations, it could be one of the spouses and the other spouse, uh, the purported abuser. It could also be children. It could also be pets. It could be farm animals. You know, these are all 
uh, different individuals or um, entities, if you will, that do have the right to protection for domestic violence order protection. On the flip side, that does not necessarily mean that they're the, the DVPO or domestic violence order protection for short, um, that the DVPO is going to also protect from say financial abuse or uh, certain forms of emotional mental manipulation through commentary. Um, rather that DVPO is there to make sure say someone is removed from the home or that they cannot possess firearms that present that physical imminent threat of harm. That's um that's a lot to take in. Right? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um so like when you're dealing with um clients, like how do you approach someone who's going to be um you know caught in the system? Like yeah. Like how yeah. do you begin to approach that? That's a that's a really good question. Um normally I try or you know my team is trained on this as well. I tried to identify if there are factors of domestic violence. Uh, as you stated a moment ago, almost a quarter of divorces cite domestic violence as a cause or probably a big basis for the reason of a divorce. Uh, and because of that, domestic violence survivors tend to have slightly different needs than say your average divorce client, the other 75%. Uh, and that could be in the way of just understanding that they even have rights. Uh, a lot of survivors may not even know that they have the right to, say, spend time with their own children, that they have the right to funds that were earned during the marriage, that they have certain rights that their abuser has told them that they do not have. So from a very uh, early point, we as, the, we as the legal advocates, the attorneys, want to make sure that there is clarity, not only about what rights, legal rights exist, but also that the abuser expressing that a uh, survivor or victim doesn't have rights is just a form of abuse itself. Um, and so it's really informing that uh, victim or survivor that this is reality. What the abuser has been telling you is not reality. And then taking one step from there um, forward. So that could be, um, we call it empowerment representation at our team, with our team. And that could be going through the mechanisms that say an average divorce client kind of already understands, but our domestic violence survivors do not understand. Gotcha. Um, so when it comes to um, like assumptions made when helping someone sure. go through a divorce that may not help a domestic violence survivor, what are those assumptions? Uh, sure. So there's, there's a bunch of them and I'll touch on a few. Um, but for example, the assumption that a domestic violence victim knows they're in a domestic violence situation. Uh, I have had plenty of times where I'm sitting across the table from a prospective client and they are naming like marital issues. And yes, no marriage is, is perfect and everyone has room for improvement. I like to say that across the board. But there are certain, uh, there are certain factors, if you will, that I'll see and I'll connect that convey to me that this is not just a unhappy marriage. This is a domestic violence situation. So, um, and, and, and go one step further, maybe the person sitting across from you is not ready to hear that they are a domestic violence victim because that happens to other people. That doesn't happen to me. That doesn't happen to you. That happens to other people. And so there is this assumption that, okay, people may know they're in it and they may, um, you know, not know what to do. Um, I would always start from the premise that maybe they don't even know they're in it um, and go one step further. Maybe it's not your place to necessarily tell them right then and there that they're in it, but rather to address the root issues that that need to be addressed to really bring um, a domestic violence victim or survivor toward that help that they need. Uh, I would say a great example, because unfortunately, children are used as pawns a lot in domestic violence, violence situations, is that uh, regardless if there's domestic violence or not, we can inform a domestic violence victim or survivor that they have custodial rights, that they have the right to see their child, that no, they're not just going to have the child taken away from them 100%. Now, does that mean the abuser may have parenting time as well? Yes. And so these are realities that will exist regardless if domestic violence exists in this relationship. Um, but it really is helping that client understand that some of these threats about the child, children just being taken is 
is false. And although I'm only licensed in North Carolina, I, I would uh, I would beg to argue that almost every family law attorney out there in all the other states would say a similar uh, premise in their states as well. Absolutely. Um, it is probably similar no matter what state you're in when you're dealing with domestic abuse. Is there something that you can um, help other professionals when they're when they realize it is domestic violence or or give them some guidelines on what to look for? Sure. So uh, the first and foremost, domestic violence survivors uh, tend to feel or have been isolated. Uh, so it's one of those situations where if they're sitting across from you, this is our chance as advocates, as divorce professionals to help domestic violence survivors get out of that bad situation. Um, and you want to make sure you're taking certain steps and saying the right thing so they don't feel further isolated. So for example, a very isolating question could be, well, why didn't you leave? Well, it's not that easy. So uh, when it comes to domestic violence survivor, there could be a multitude of reasons. Go one step further. When a domestic violence victim is trying to leave the violent situation, that's when they are actually exposed to the greatest amount of harm, either them, their children, their pets, and other individuals involved. So we want to be cognizant that even asking that question can make them feel isolated. Also, connecting them to resources. Now, yes, you may be um, sitting across the table from someone who has a graduate degree in accounting. That does not mean that they know about their family's finances, because if they're the, the victim or the survivor, then it's very possible that as a form of the abuse, they've been cut off from those financial resources. They have been cut off from even knowing the very basics of the marital estate or the marital expenditures. So if, if you, especially as an attorney, send, say, a budget or asset debt spreadsheet to a domestic violence uh, victim or survivor, you may make them feel isolated because they just don't know that information and they don't have that information. So it's really starting from square one, identifying the needs of the person that's sitting across from you, domestic violence or otherwise, and then going into those specific needs to address each and every one of them. Uh, from our side, when I say empowerment representation, we add even um, some more to that. And what I mean by that is, for example, let's say legally, I need pictures. I need pictures of the house. I need pictures of the children. I then uh, express to my client saying, hey, this is what I need to help you for your legal case. What are some ideas that you have that I can obtain those pictures? Um, and, and simply asking the question that way will not only make the, um, the situation feel like uh, the survivor has some say and control, but it also allows them to think for themselves, which may have, may have been a rarity during the domestic violence uh, relationship because everything was determined for them. And then go one step further, um, at least for the parents that I've served who've been survivors, um, there's nothing more fun than looking back at happy memories with their children to say, okay, yes, I can do this. I'm seeing the faces of my children. Let me get this you know, particular picture of this certain memory to my attorney so we can convey that story to, to the court. What a great um, idea to help them feel empowered. I love that. Um, you were mentioning that they were feeling isolated. Mm -hmm. I think they would also feel judged by certain things that people say. And I think professionals who work with them have to be careful about yeah. making them feel judged because, you know, they're at a very vulnerable and sensitive place. Yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, do you have any tips for, for that? Like what, what they shouldn't say other than what you had just outlined? Sure. Uh, I mean, I, I think that, yeah, just touching on what I said earlier is like, if you turn and call them a victim, then you're suddenly putting a label on them. Um, and even as I say them, it's like domestic violence survivors are us. Like we are all part of a grander community and it really is paying due respect to the person who has endured a trauma and, and helping them through it. Um, so not making assumptions, really asking a lot of questions, not putting labels 
on the person sitting across from you and, and really letting them express their needs instead of you telling them necessarily what they need. Um, and what I mean by that is, of course, I know the law as an attorney, um, but if I ask my client, you know, what do you want for your children? And they were in the client prospective client responds and says, well, I want my children to be safe. Then I'll say, OK, well, let's get your children safe because that's what you want and need. This is one way we can do it with the law. You know, not that you have to file child custody. It, it comes across just very differently um, than if you're more sensitive to their needs. I love that. I really do, because I don't think, um, especially, you know, when you're working with regular, you know, clients who haven't had this experience, you're not thinking about these things. And I think mm -hmm. it's really important to educate people and, and make them think about things in a different way. So yeah. I really appreciate, um, your sharing all of that. So, um, this has been really interesting and educational so far. We have a lot more to get to, but right now we're going to take a short break and I'm going to um, talk about something. So give me a couple minutes to do that. Sure. Awesome. So domestic abuse, abuse survivors experience a lack of trust in the divorce and legal systems in place to protect them. Research shows that many report re-traumatization in court and reported that legal professionals verbally threatened them, mocked them, did not give them a chance to speak in court, exaggerated the survivor's faults in court, and provoked them to elicit emotional reactions. In other cases, divorce professionals may be the first point of contact for survivors with the ability to help if they recognize the signs. The Divorce Coalition is a nonprofit organization created to change this experience for abuse victims and survivors through education and awareness of divorce professionals. For more information, go to www.divorcecoalition.com. Please support us by making a tax deductible donation at www.divorcecoalition.com slash donate dash now. And now back to the show. So Teresa, I don't know, um, some of the things I was talking about is exactly what you're talking about. You know, just people who don't understand um, domestic violence and the effect of that um, on the divorce process. So it's so wonderful that you're here sharing your information and educating all of us. Um, so I have a question about the common pitfalls that could hurt domestic violent survivors when going through divorce. Other than what you've already talked about, do you have some advice about that? Yes. Um, and, and when I think pitfalls, I think it's honestly failures of the justice system specifically that still exist because it's based on, let's, let's be honest, it's an archaic system where, you know, this is the same justice system where divorce used to be illegal. Um, this is the same justice system where you actually had to file something with the courts before you can even separate and live under uh, a different roof from your spouse um, and pursue divorce. Um, now, those laws don't exist. They've been taken off the books. They may have even been off the books for over 100 years. But we are still in a very adversarial judicial system. A family court case is treated very similar to a criminal case where you have the state pursuing someone who has been charged with a crime. It's very similar to two businesses fighting over a contractual agreement. And what that means is, is there's like a lot, there's no, there's actually a lot, a lot of mudslinging. There's a lot of tools that are then used and abused in the litigation process. And for domestic violence survivors specifically, it can turn into feeling a lot like abuse again and re-traumatization and re-victimization and the list goes on from there. Uh, I give a perfect example. So as a certified mediator, the, part of the reason I even became a mediator is I do think a lot of family matters are better served outside of a courtroom. And this is generally not just for domestic violence situations. And what I mean by that is Nobody knows your children better than you. And yes, the opposing side, the other parents. They may be your ex now, but they're still the other parent. Uh, additionally, no one knows your finances, your housing situation, your day-to-day, -day, your work situation better than you. And so when you are in the mediation process, when you're dealing with these family law issues, including domestic violence, 
A mediation provides a platform by which, although it's both sides, it is the parties themselves that are empowered and able to influence the outcome. In comparison, if you go through the litigation route and you go and have a trial on any of these issues, whether it's distribution of the house or child custody, you are then giving the final decision-making authority out of either party's hands, including the domestic violence survivor, and giving it to a judge. And whether we like it or not, a judge has not lived in your life, has not lived in the life of the domestic violence survivor, has maybe not even met the children, has barely reviewed financial documents to know what the financial situation is. And although the judge is very smart <laughs> and they are lawyers, maybe they didn't really practice family law, they are still strangers to that family situation. And so, uh, especially for some of my domestic violence situations, yes, we want the protection of maybe a protective order and maybe some other injunctive relief. But when it comes down to making decisions about the children, maybe giving that decision-making authority to a judge, yet another person that's gonna once again tell the domestic violence survivor what they can and cannot do, is not always the best tool. Maybe it's necessary, but if there's other avenues that can be pursued, that is generally what I advise. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, the the stress of going to court and letting a judge make this decision versus working it out through mediation is, I mean, it's, it's no comparison. I mean, a lot of divorce... Um, domestic violence victims are concerned about mediation because they don't want to be in the same room mm -hmm. as their, you know, abuser. So what would you say about something like that? That then falls on the divorce professionals. Uh, so to our earlier point, another piece of advice, maybe not have a live mediation. We have so much online, online technology that we're actually utilizing right now for this recording right. that can be used, say, in a virtual mediation. Um, some alternatives are also um, just because maybe it is better to do it in person because we can get signatures right then and there and some of the legally binding documents is make sure we do not have a joint session. So at no time is the victim actually in the same room as their abuser. Um, go even one step further than that. I have literally scheduled times when I'm the mediator. I will schedule arrival and exit times that are separate for both sides. I also make sure they're on opposite. So I have a relative, like a 2,000 square, uh, square foot office. And I literally will place the parties at completely opposite ends of the office. We even have technology that if so, someone goes to use the restroom, we make sure everyone's informed so we know where everyone is at any given time. And so it is paying attention to those finer details and having those protection mechanisms, if you will, in place that can help make mediation a lot more secure, as well as empowering for a domestic violence survivor. That's amazing. Um, so when you're saying they're at opposite ends of your office, they're, are, they're not in the same room? Not even close. Okay. And, and so, for example, when I mediate, if domestic violence is involved, I actually, as a mediator, recommend that we do separate, um, separate rooms and they never even cross, cross paths. Um, if needed, though, just because some attorneys will want to make sure that the same directions were explained to both sides at the same time in the exact same way. Again, that's using technology. I can set up a laptop in one office and I can sit in the other office with, you know, uh, the virtual meeting going. And, and so there's there's all these tools that we can use to make sure that any concerns can really be addressed. We just have to get creative. And why not get creative if we can do what's best for our clients, especially the domestic violence populations that we're serving? Absolutely. It's so interesting um, how you've been able to help your clients so much. And I I assume most attorneys don't know this much. So how do they find attorneys who are like you who really understand this population? That is a wonderful question. <laughs> I wish I even had a better answer because I have an answer, but it, I don't know if it's going to be the best. It honestly is just doing the research. Um, and and I'll, I'll be honest, I, you know, my story is online, it's on my website, you referenced it earlier. Um, and so I, I do get domestic violence a little bit differently than other attorneys. Um, that's not to say that there aren't other attorneys, especially here in Charlotte, we have a lot of attorneys 
that don't understand domestic violence, but we approach things differently. So for a domestic violence survivor, I highly encourage them to do the research to, if you can, schedule more than one consultation. Um, I jokingly will say, you know, shopping for attorneys is like shopping for shoes. Just because they're in the right size doesn't mean they're a comfortable fit. And, and really, it's finding that comfortable fit because at the end of the day, we're not just talking about buying a car. We're talking about the safety of our survivors, the safety of children, the safety of their families. We're talking about the financial security, housing. All of these things that are so integral in, in living a life and then not only getting out of a bad situation, but, but also preparing that survivor for the next chapter of their life. And I really do not want a survivor to walk out of, say, a mediation or, or even a courtroom not knowing where they're going to you know, pay their, for their next meal or where they're going to stay the night or when they're going to see their child. We as the divorce professionals have the obligation to take every step, creative step at that possible to address those needs. Absolutely. And um, you're doing a great service. So um, what do you think, is there anything else that you'd like to share with, with our audience? I think especially to anyone who has or is or uh, thinking about leaving a domestic violence situation, um, is they've, everyone's probably heard it before, but you really aren't alone. And there are researchers out there. Um, yes, attorneys are expensive. I, I'm not going to sit here and say that they're free. Um, there are some pro bono resources out there, uh, but it really is figuring out what is the best next step for you as you go through this process, through the divorce process, domestic violence or otherwise, being informed of what your legal rights are and then creating a strategy moving forward is always the best first step. Absolutely. And I just put the um, National Domestic Violence Hotline number on there, um, 800-799-SAFE, 7233. So they have some resources that are free. And um, I know it's hard to um, find resources when you don't have a good financial situation or you have financial abuse. Um, do you have any resources that help people who don't have access to financial resources? Like, do you know of any organizations or sure. you know, places people can look for? Um, I, I would say we are pretty fortunate here in Charlotte, North Carolina, where my office is based, as well as the surrounding areas. There are a number of nonprofit organizations specifically focused as, at serving the needs of victims of abuse, victims of domestic violence, uh, survivors, I, I'll say, and survivors of sexual assault or sexual abuse. Um, in Mecklenburg County specifically, we have an organization called Safe Alliance. We also have a child advocacy center um, because at, at times, unfortunately, children are also impacted or become the direct victims themselves. And um, we have a number of child advocacy centers throughout North Carolina, and they are, I mean, I can't even express how grateful I am to all the efforts that they do to help reduce the re-traumatization, um, especially for children. And then also giving the parents and, and other um, people with uh, custody of, of um, child victims tools, tools to really address a, a child's needs. Um, go one step further, we also have a self-serve center at the Mecklenburg County Courthouse. It is very unique to our county. Um, I will say a uh, little word to the wise, if you're in North Carolina, even if you are in a county very, very far away from Mecklenburg County, uh, a lot, if not all of the forms available in our self-serve center also can work at your local courthouse. Um, there's also a number of legal aid of North Carolina forms online. A good example is there are form child custody complaints that you can uh, draft and file. Uh, and we also do have at times low bono, i.e. reduced legal fee services or pro bono free legal services to certain individuals. Um, could be dependent on uh, socioeconomic status or simply because uh, it's the need of that case. Either way, I always say try to consult with an attorney. Be careful where you find your research, even if it's uh, via Google. 
Uh, think about looking at law firm websites versus posting a question on Facebook, for example, um, because at least the lawyers, we have a lot of ethical duties that we have to abide by. So the information you find on our websites, um, I will say are generally a lot more reliable than a response to a Facebook feed. So find those resources, they're out there. Check out our website. We have a lot of resources, again, free on our website. So the help is out there. And, and I, I guess I'll just stress again, you know, you're not alone if you're in a domestic violence situation um, and there are people to help. Awesome. Well, I just put your website up on the screen. Um, how can our audience find you? Sure. So the easiest is, yeah, check out our website, modernlegalnc.com. Uh, we have a number of different pages on those social media platforms that I just referenced. So don't worry, I'm not bad mouthing the platforms. I'm just saying careful where you post your questions. Yeah. Um, and so on those social media platforms, we do a lot of announcements. Our team tries to publish regular um, articles. And that could be so we have articles in national publications like USA Today, or we have uh, publications that are very specific to very uh, unique issues like custody of your pets, for example, under North Carolina law. Uh, and then finally, I'm going to touch on our podcast because we just released a podcast this past January. It's called Legal Lounge, Legal Lounge with the Modern Legal Team. And that podcast really is aimed at having any listener join in on the conversation that attorneys and other divorce professionals have behind the scenes. Because I do know a lot of my clients are like, well, you know, what do you talk about? Or what are you thinking of? Aside from what they see on their invoices, <laughs> they're like, what are you actually discussing? And in Legal Lounge really is that, that window into what attorneys are discussing and talking about and ideas um, and, and concerns, honestly, that we address when we are serving our clients. That's such a great resource. And um, I'm sure that you're going to have a lot of good um, information for people there. So that is amazing. Thank you so much. Of course. So first of all, thank you so much for being my guest today and um, giving so much information that's really important for our viewers to, um, to know. And to my audience, thank you for being with Teresa and myself on this episode of Divorce Coach Live. If you'd like to listen to this episode again, you can find the link at www.divorcecoalition.com live tap show tab. All of Teresa's information will be available in the show notes. We have a special gift for our audience, a free ebook called Stop Condoning Domestic Violence at www.divorcecoalition.com slash stop dash condoning dash ebook. So you can find the Divorce Coalition at divorcecoalition.com and please like and share our Instagram page at Divorce Coalition page. Join us in the fight to change and abuse survivor's divorce journey. Stay tuned next Thursday at 9 a.m. Eastern for another episode of Divorce Coalition Live. Take care.